Well, good morning again, Valley Church. How's everybody feeling this morning? If you're like me, you're really tired. Is anybody tired this morning? If you have kids in band competitions, then you know what one o'clock in the morning means more so than anybody else. Um, but it's awesome and it's wonderful and I love it. So, but all right, now we're here this morning. We're finishing these last two weeks. Is there one more week after this? Yes. Who wrote these sermons anyway? Um, there's one more week of Jonah after this. The series we've been studying is called The Big, The Bad, and The Ugly. And I use that to describe myself most of the time. But this time, it was for the big fish, the bad city, and the ugly attitude. And Tony's been keeping me straight because I've been saying them backwards. But so this morning, we're talking about the bad city spared. And if you haven't been here, how many of you know the story of Jonah, whether you've been here for the last couple of weeks or not? You should. So if you don't, I'll recap it real quick. The video sort of uh, recapped us to where we're at. The, uh, Jonah was told by God to go preach to Nineveh. We learned the first week that um, Nineveh was like the enemies of Jonah. That's the reason he didn't want to go there. He, he had nothing in common with them, and he saw them as not even worthy of God's grace. So he went the other way. He got on a boat going the opposite direction. The storm came. The people in the boat with him were worried, and they were like, what's going on? And he finally decided to commit suicide, basically, uh, throw himself over the edge of the boat. Uh, and then at his last breath, we learned the second week that God saved him with a fish and there was a prayer that he prayed but we learned in that prayer that he was happy God saved him but he still wasn't very uh, repentant about not wanting going to Nineveh but God saved him anyway and we talked about how God uses us even if we're not ready a hundred percent we talked about um, the second chance that Jonah got last week the big redo and how the funniest thing was is how, how he probably smelt after three days in the belly of a fish and then preaching around Nineveh for three days, which is a city that's 60 miles across. Um, he probably smelt pretty good. I don't know if they make Ode to Jonah cologne, but would you buy it? <laughs> it's like, you know, going to the fish market at the grocery store and just rubbing some around your neck. Would you wear that cologne? No, probably not. Anyway, so, so God gave Jonah a second chance, and he went and preached for three days. And we talked about how, how um, even though Jonah relented, I mean, did not uh, want to go preach to his enemies, uh, he did anyway. And so this morning we're at the place where the city heard what he said and repented. And so we're talking about the bad city spared. So I'm going to pray again, and then we're going to dive into the Word, chapter 3. And uh, let's start. Father, we just want to take this time, and do, we just want to thank you for your Word. And we want to take this time to honor it, and that you would use it to change us. It does us no good if we come in here and read it, if, if we don't change something, if you don't change something in our hearts when we leave. And we pray right now that you would uh, allow us to open up to you, that your spirit would speak right now, that it wouldn't be me up here, that it wouldn't be my voice, but it would be yours, and that your word would change us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're going to start at chapter 3, verse 3. The story said, Jonah obeyed this time. How many of you have those times in your life where you've ran the other way for so long and then finally you were like okay God I'll try it your way that's pretty much where Jonah was at he didn't really have any other choice uh, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh now Nineveh was a very large city it took three days to go through it Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown from the greatest to the least. Oh, wait a minute. I, I skipped something. The Ninevites believed God. And fast was proclaimed. A fast was proclaimed and for all of them. From the greatest to the least. Put on sackcloth. 
So um, let's just start with what does it mean to put on sackcloth and fast? We'll get to that. Has anybody ever heard the word revival? Any younger generations that, if you don't know what we mean by revival, a revival happens when people that used to believe in God and used to live, live like they believed in God once again turn back to God and start living godly lives. And you can look out th throughout history, there has been some great revivals that have happened. Um, and a lot of people call this a great revival. But I don't necessarily agree that Nineveh was a revival because they didn't believe the same way Jonah believed. They didn't believe in the same God Jonah believed. These were all new believers when you think about it. The city was 120,000 people. 60 miles across. Now, when we talk about, we look back in the Bible and we look at sermons, great sermons in the Bible, and we usually look at Peter and Pentecost and, and 300 were saved. We're talking 120,000 were saved. You've got 40 days or death, is what Jonah preached. How many of you go to those, like to go, would like to go hear that sermon every week? Um, when I was younger, we had uh, preachers and they, they preached what we call hell, fire, and brimstone sermons. And they would jump up and down. And I, I've, I've threatened that I'm going to do a, a Baptist preacher impersonation up here one, one Sunday because that's what I grew up with. So if I do that, don't get scared. I'm just going you know, start jumping up and down and coming off the stage and, and doing those. But... That was what Jonah was preaching in this particular sermon. Why? That's what God called him to preach. And finally he listened. And sometimes we need to hear that hell is real and fire is hot. And that's what the Ninevites needed to hear. That there was 40 days left till destruction. And they responded. So, I don't know of any other sermon in history in the Bible that was 120,000 people preached by a preacher that didn't want to preach it. <laughs> and, and as we'll find out next week, hoped they didn't listen. Because he goes up on a hill and hopes to watch the city get destroyed. Now, I'm using all those thoughts in your brain because we love to put ourselves on a pedestal or put ourselves in a category and put point at other people that we think don't deserve God's grace. And it took almost suicide and, and death before Jonah would do what God called him to do, was go out to the people that he didn't think deserved God's grace to preach to them God's grace through the message of destruction. Because how do you know if uh, there's going to be grace unless you know that the destruction's coming? But... What we always get focused on is the city. Well, the real story is in Jonah's heart, so watch that. But this week we are talking about the city, but next week we'll really dig into Jonah's heart. So, back to, back to putting ourselves in a situation, because what we've got to do is take the Bible, read it, understand what it was being written for, and to, who it was being written to and why. Then we translate that into how does that apply to us. So, Jonah's the church. Nineveh is everywhere that all of us that call ourselves Christians think we're better than somebody else out there because we have something they don't have. Now you can use yourself and come up with your own categories because we could, we could spend all day on that, but everybody. 
Everybody. Even if they don't believe like us or they have a different religion like us other than us or they have another God other than us because that's what God has called us to. So that's how we can relate. Jonah is representative of the church. Nineveh is representative of everybody else out there. And guess what? God's grace, relentless grace, is that all shall believe. He wants all. So, this morning we're going to talk about ready, willing, and able. These are not friends of mine. These are what we have to be if God's going to use us. So we're going to look at Jonah first, verse 3, 3 through 5. First thing, Jonah was ready to go this time. I'll say this time, when God calls. Now, this time, how many times are you ready to go when God calls? And here's the, I'm going to use another example of Jonah's life and our life. We don't have the backstory of when God called Jonah. Maybe the backstory was, and, and I'm making this up, so don't quote me that I'm, I'm making stuff up in the Bible. I'm just, I'm just trying to get some thought in your head so it, it applies to us a little better. Maybe Jonah just got married and had started a family and it was inconvenient for him to go preach. Maybe that's not it. Maybe Jonah had a kid in college and it was not the right time for him to leave to go and preach. No, maybe um, Jonah's donkey was sick and he had to take it to the vet. Now, that sounds dumb, right? But how many times do we use those types of excuses when God calls us? My cable's out, so I've got to stay at home and wait for the cable guy. I can't go to the gate. I can't go today, Lord. Um, I think I might have a flat tire next week, so I need to go to the, whatever. Point is being, how many times does God call us the second time or the third time, and then we've got the excuse? We don't know all of what Jonah's excuse was, but maybe it was. Mostly he didn't like them, but maybe there was something else. You know, it was a birthday party he had to go to or... Um, anyway, I'll stop. Um, so, Jonah was ready, finally, the second time. We learned in verse 3 that Jonah obeyed this time. He was ready to go. The next thing Jonah was, he was willing to go this time. Now, how many times have we, and I do this in my life, and so I know it's at least one of us in here that does it. How many times do, do we, like, I fail? Oh, Lord. I'm sorry, Lord. Next time, I'll be ready. So the next time something happens, then I'm ready. But I'm not quite willing yet. That's going to be a little out of the out of the realm of possibilities for me. I'm, I'm ready, Lord, but can, can we try something different? He was ready, he was willing. Willing to travel three days on foot, smelling like a sushi bar. To preach to the people that he hated. And the last thing Jonah was, he was able, finally able to put aside the selfish desires. Maybe not all the way, because even in his heart, we'll find out next week that he sort of hoped they didn't repent. Which sounds terrible, right? Sounds terrible that, that somebody would hope that other people out there would not hear God's message in turn and that they would die in their sin. Do we live like that? Do we secretly hope that 
Those out there that are our enemies get what they deserve. Man, I hope they get what they deserve. But all the time we're thankful that we got grace and we've been saved. That's the true story here in this passage and, and, and this story about Jonah. That's what God really wants us to see is secretly enjoying our grace but when we're looking at other people hoping they get what they deserve. I hope I don't get what I deserve. So, Jonah was finally ready to go when God called him. He was finally willing and able to put aside the, the, the selfish desires. God is always ready, willing, and able. We're going to learn that next. Um, he's always ready to love the lost. Always ready. If there's a story of hope in here for you guys this morning, it's the story of Jonah. The story of Jonah, it, two parts. One, Jonah was... A sorry, no good, lousy, hating prophet. Wait a minute. He was a prophet. And he had a bad attitude. But God used him anyway. So that should make us hopeful. The city was sorry, no good. They, they didn't believe in God in any way. And they, they didn't live like that. They even had like a, a temple of like fertility. And there was like prostitution towards gods and stuff going on. They did not deserve God's grace, but He gave them grace. He gave Jonah grace. He gave the great city grace. God's always ready to love the lost. There's nowhere that you've ever been that's too far out of the reach of God's grace. Nowhere. There's nothing that you've ever done that will keep him from loving you if you'll repent and turn to him. Nothing. And a lot of times I've heard it over and over again. If I walk into the church, I'll get struck by lightning. No, if you walk into the church, the angels in heaven will sing and praise. He's waiting. He's longing for you to come home. He's longing for you to come close. He's gone way above wanting that relationship and that closeness. And the story of Jonah proclaims that to all of us. So he's ready to love the lost. He's always, God is always willing to seek the lost. Always. And I don't know if I'm the only one, you know, I've shared my testimony or parts of my testimony there are times that I look back into my life and I think about where I was in the moment of drug addiction and alcoholism and, and, and so many other things. And I could not picture a God that loved me in that moment in my life. And I don't know how many of you have ever been there. But now when I look back, I see there's so many times that he got me through stuff, even then. And if I don't feel worthy to be up here. That's why I identify with people like Jonah and Peter. Because they failed and they're not perfect. But God loved them and used them anyway. And that's the same story for each of us in here. His relentless grace. He's always willing. And there's probably times in your life when, when he was there and, and you didn't know he was there. You didn't believe he was there. But he was there. God's able. He's always able to change the hearts of the lost. Now, we get this one mixed up a lot of times as Christians. And sometimes the longer we've been a Christian, the harder it is to let God do the work and to quit trying to do the work for Him. 
But he's able to change the hearts. You look at verse 6 and 7. When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, it says, From his throne he took off his royal robes. He covered himself in sackcloth and sat down in dust. Now, this is a picture of repentance. If you can imagine the king above everybody as a sign of repentance to God, he takes off his royal robes and sits down in dust and ashes. And a lot of times they would cover themselves in it as a sign of repentance, as a sign of being humbled. And the key, the king put a decree that everybody should fast and, and everybody should turn from the evil ways. That's repentance to turn around. But God is able to take a people, 120,000 people in a city and change their hearts. And change their lives. Do you guys believe that today? Do you really believe that God can change people's lives and hearts? Do you? Because do we live like we believe that? Do we take time to invest in people's lives that we know don't believe because we believe our investing into their lives will have an opportunity to change them because God's called us to that? Do we live like that? Or do we, do we put up the, I'm Christian, don't talk to me if we don't have anything in common. Do we put up the wall that says, I'm holier than thou. And anything you say to me, I'm going to fight you on it. And I'm going to be irritating because I'm going to shove it down your throat that it's wrong and it's horrible. And, and then the Bible tells us to speak the truth in love. Jesus went to every leper. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. He didn't have to touch the leper to heal them, but in a compassion and way because they hadn't been touched in so long. He touched them. He still lived the truth. He still spoke the truth. But he went and he touched and he had conversations even to the point of the religious people saying, why does he eat with those sinners and prostitutes and lepers? All those different people. God is able to change the hearts of the lost. And then we're going to talk about the people who are seeking God's forgiveness and God's grace. They, they have to be ready, willing, and able to. Verse 8 through 10 says, But let the people and the animals be covered in sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. This is the king giving a decree to all of the people. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. And who knows? It says in verse 9, God may yet relent with compassion and turn from His fierce anger so that we will not perish. Now I want to look a little bit at somebody that's turning back to God. And then verse 10 says, When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented, and he did not bring them to destruction. He had to the destruction he had threatened. First of all, they were finally ready to hear the truth. And a lot of times, God is very patient. With me, he has been very patient because that was well past my 20s. 
before I was ready to hear the truth. And if you use your own relationship with God as a, a guideline to how long it may take you to be in relationship with somebody that doesn't believe in God before they're ready to hear the truth from you, that's a long investment. It's not about shoving the truth down somebody's throat as much as it is about living it. And when people see the difference in you, and I saw you go through that struggle for the last three years, and, and the way you lived and, and the, the faith that you had intrigues me. What is it about you that's different? That's when people are ready to hear the truth. There's something different. And, and you think about Jonah going to a city of enemies and preaching a message. Do you think part of the reason they listened is because, wow, those Jews never have anything to do with us. Every time I've ever had any interaction with any of them, they've just said bad things about us and talked about how we were reprobate. But this guy came all the way over here to warn us. He took time. It showed that he cared. So they were ready to hear the truth. The next thing that we learn about people that, that are ready to, to have a relationship with God and turn for their ways, uh, they, they were willing to turn from their sins. It says, the, the funny thing of the list of stuff to do, let all the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. He also told them they had to fast. And they says, turn from their violence and their evil ways. How many of you would be excited this morning? President Obama gets on the um, TV this morning and, and says, I'm calling a national fast and prayer. And I want all of you to put sackcloth on and go outside and sit in the dust. And pray fervently to God that He'll forgive us. And that, that He'll give us grace and mercy if we all turn from our evil ways. And we're going to fast until we find out. Because He gave us 40 days. So I want everyone to, to pray and fast until the end of the 40 days, and let's pray that God will forgive us. How many of you would be excited this morning? How many of you could fast <laughs> and go without your McDonald's? And now I know it would probably be easy to put a, a animals in, in sackcloth, but how do you keep sackcloth on it? I don't know. Sometimes I question these things. I'm like, how do they, if they have, you know, 500 sheep, there had to be a lot of sackcloth around to cover that up. Anyway, um, so have to be willing to turn from their sins. Willing. Are we willing this morning? Are we willing to turn from our sins? And then able to swallow their pride and ask for forgiveness. The, the irony of, of this end of the chapter 3, parallel to the end of chapter 4, if you're, if you're one of those Bible study gurus and you want to you wanna dig into something really cool, go, go parallel the end of chapter 3 and the end of chapter 4 and just look at the difference. Look at the grace that God offers the people who didn't deserve it because they turned from their ways. And then look at the grace that God offers Jonah 
And then the conversation they have about Jonah's unwillingness, which we'll talk about next week. So, ready, willing, and able. We're going to go over that real quick. Jonah was ready to go this time when God called. He was willing to go where God called him to go. And he was able to finally put his pride in his pocket. God is always ready to love the lost and willing to seek the lost and able to change the hearts of the lost. And here's another sentence I'll add to that. He's always able to change the hearts of the saved too. Because sometimes, in Jonah's case, he believed. But Jonah needed a heart change too. How many of us in here need a heart change this morning even though we believe? So that puts the last ready, willing, and able back on us. We have to be ready to hear the truth. We have to be willing to turn from our sin. And we have to be able to swallow our own pride for forgiveness. Are you ready? Willing? Able? Let's bow our heads. Father, this morning we're grateful for your word again, how it speaks to us and how, how the stories in it um, proclaim to us your grace and your love and your mercy. And, and Lord, this morning we ask that, that you would just keep this in our minds and in our hearts as we go through our days this week, that you are calling us out there to people different than us. And that we have to be ready and willing and able to deliver the message in love. And to have a relationship and, and, and to build into the lives of people. Because that's what you've called us to do. And that's what you did when you were here on this planet with us. And, and, and that's what you're guiding us through your spirit to continue to do. Lord, we pray this morning that, that you would make us... See our hearts and see the amount of forgiveness that you gave us and that you offered us and the amount of love that you offered us and, and make it well up inside of us to the point of overflowing that, that we will have to share it and that we will have to give it out. Because when you're in it, we can't stop it. We believe you can change people's hearts. We believe that you want to use us. We believe that even though we're not perfect and never be perfect, that you want to use us to share your grace and love. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.